Good afternoon. Perhaps we should get going. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Adam Tooze. I'm the director of the European Institute here at Columbia, and I'm delighted you to, to welcome you to this event on transforming the Eurozone, organised by the European Institute in cooperation with the Maison Française, our kind hosts here. We're honoured to have with us Pierre Moscovici, European Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs, Taxation and Customs, who will discuss with us the EU economic outlook as well as ideas for deepening and democratising the Eurozone and for building a more transparent and growth-friendly tax system. Commissioner Moscovici is particularly well-placed to tell us about these topics. Uh, within the European Commission, he's been responsible for economic and financial affairs for almost three years now in the Juncker Commission. And before joining the Commission, he was Minister for Economy and Finance for France. And he had a very long and distinguished career, he was telling us over lunch, in European politics, really the great commitment in some sense of your political life. As a Vice President of the European Parliament for two terms, as a member of the Convention on the Future of Europe, and at the national and local level in France, as a member of the French Parliament, as Minister for European Affairs, and in several elected positions in the Franche Comte region, the most European of European regions. The most beautiful. Mm, of course. Mr. Commissioner, uh, thank you for being with us today. We're very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts about the Eurozone and its outlook. I'll have the pleasure of moderating the discussion and the question and answer session uh, with you, the audience. Um, this event is part of the European Institute Lecture Series. Last year we were honoured to welcome in this series Federico Mogherini, the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security <laughs> Policy, Vice President of the European Commission. Previous speakers in this series have included Samantha Power, Christopher Patton and Joseph Biden, among others. The discussion and the Q&A session are on the record and will be videotaped and we'll, end to, we'll aim to wrap things up punctually at 2pm. I'd like to thank our co-sponsor Maison Francaise and Shani Pierre in particular who is welcoming us to this lovely room and are such good friends of the European Institute. I would also like to express our gratitude in particular to Moreno, there you are, Moreno Bertoldi, uh, Minister, Council, Minister Council at the EU delegation to the United States and again a great long-term supporter and interlocutor of the European Institute here at Columbia. And we'd also like to express our thanks to the Columbia European Union Student Association. But before we start our discussion, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Moscovici. I think um, maybe from the point of view of our audience and to sort of establish a sense of where we're at, it would be interesting at this moment to get from you the way the European economic outlook, and perhaps because I know the Eurozone is really at the heart of your interests, uh, perhaps from you a sense of where you see the trajectory of the Eurozone economy at this moment. Where are we uh, in relation to the crises of previous years, perhaps also against the benchmark of our expectations for the Euro at its founding? Um, are we still in a moment of crisis at this point? Because that, you can still get that sense sometimes from the American discussion, or do you see us of having moved decisively beyond that? Thank you. First of all, uh, I would like to say I'm pleased and honored to be here today. Uh, I would say, in a way, back to Colombia, where I teach a dozen years ago, uh, when I was associate professor in Sciences Po in SIPA for a few weeks. And was, uh, of course, a tremendous uh, souvenir. Uh, and I, I know how prestigious this university is, and I'm very honored to be in that event. Uh, it's true that I've been for five years now uh, at the heart of the uh, Eurozone, sitting in uh, what we call the Eurogroup, which is the uh, meeting of finance ministers of the Eurozone, two years as a finance minister for my country. Uh, France, and then three years as a EU Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs. And I also uh, represent the uh, Commission in, in bodies like the G7, at the finance minister levels, uh, the G20 at the same level, uh, the IMF, uh, etc. So in, uh, I would say, global forums. And if I would be there five years ago, we were in a time of terrible crisis. When I came 
first in my office in Bercy. Bercy is the Ministry of Finance in France. Uh, it was the Greek crisis which mobilized us a lot. A few weeks after, uh, I went here in the US, first to visit President Obama with uh, President Hollande, then to the G20 um, in Los Cabos in Mexico, and we were discussing all around about the Greek crisis. At the time, things were clear. Uh, Europe was a problem. It was a problem for world growth, it was a problem for world stability, and Greece was uh, really a, a wound uh, for us all. And we discussed that among us, but also with uh, our American friends from the then uh, Obama administration. If I would have been there one year ago, not five years ago, we would have discussed all around about the threat of populism, uh, because there were Austrian elections coming for the election of the president. The far right seemed to be very close to win these elections. Uh, there were elections coming in Netherlands, and then Mr. Wilders, who is a racist, uh, anti-European leader, uh, seemed to be quite well placed to become the prime minister of Netherlands. Netherlands is a founding member of uh, Europe. And in France, we saw uh, the elections coming with the fear that Madame Le Pen would, if not win, but be very close to win the presidential election. I never thought she uh, could, because I know my fellow uh, countrymen, uh, you, you won't fight 50% of the French fool enough to vote for the fire right. But still, I feel that she would be at somewhere like 40%. One year ago, that was it. Now, uh, populism has suffered some electoral defeats in Europe, and that's a good thing. Mr. Wilders came second, and Le Pen was in the second round with rather weak score of 33%. And the Austrian president is Mr. Van der Bellen, uh, a Green, uh, supported by uh, mainstream parties, but uh, it was a quite close election. That doesn't mean that maybe we'll talk about populism is dead, but it suffered some defeats. And we are in a different moment now, uh, in uh, uh, September 2017. What is that moment? First, economically, Europe is getting much, much better. It is not a part of the problem now, it is a part of the solution. We are in the fifth year of uh, our recovery, and I would say that is the first year where people really perceive that for themselves, mm -hmm. because now growth is uh, strong, around 2%. It is everywhere inside the Eurozone. Uh, some countries like Italy, who suffered from very long stagnation, are now also <laughs> growing. Uh, this uh, growth is uh, self-sustained. All the engines are now functioning, uh, consumption, but also investment, although we can do better. We have now a more stable situation as far as our public finances are concerned, where our deficits are constantly reduced. Most of our countries have made structural reforms, uh, and so I'm rather confident that this growth now uh, is well in place. And I also believe that this growth is perceived by the people for a very simple reason, that it is creating a lot of jobs. We have never been creating as many jobs as today. That doesn't mean that our unemployment rate is uh, uh, low enough, because we are still over 9%, but uh, now uh, unemployment is decreasing <coughs> rapidly. That's for economy. Uh, I'm not a Marxist now for many decades, talking about my youth. Uh, I don't think that systematically uh, the economy uh, leads to a uh, better economy, leads to better politics and symmetrically, but there is a linkage. Uh, and politically, uh, of course, things are much better too. Uh, because populism uh, has suffered defeats, and because now there are as well pro-European leaders and pro-European sentiment in our public opinions for a while. Not forever, and not that solid, not that great, but I'm cautiously optimistic. If I look at leaders, of course, France elected uh, Emmanuel Macron, who is uh, with a pro-European agenda. That was courageous from him. He was right to do so. He was the first one in decades to, to campaign on that in France, and he was elected, not only for that, but also for that, and he sticks to that. Uh, I don't know exactly what will happen in German elections, but there will be a pro-European chancellor 
and a pro-European government, although the far right will, for the first time since World War II, get back into the Bundestag. That will be a very strong event. Same in Italy, etc., etc. Uh, and so uh, there are now pro-European leaders, and, and, and the attachment to the European public opinion to Europe is higher than it was in the last 10 years everywhere. Uh, and so this creates a momentum to relaunch Europe. Why Euro? For two reasons. The first one is that uh, when I look at the attachments of uh, European citizens to Europe, their first attachment is to the Eurozone. Why? We discussed that at lunch with uh, some colleagues of you. Because it's perceived as stability, protection, security, unity, and unity creates strengths. The second reason is because after Brexit, sorry, but it will happen on the 29th of March 2019 at midnight, UK won't be a member of the EU anymore. The Eurozone will be 85% of the GDP of the total uh, European Union. And that proves that it is a strategic, strategic reform that we must do. How? More efficiency, more democracy, stronger tools in order to reduce divergences. So that was a rapid uh, overview of, of where we are in my view. My conclusion on that is that we have a momentum now, now, uh, after the election of Macron, after what happens in Germany, I cannot say what will be the outcome, but some, I had some thoughts about that, as everybody, but must not express on the election before it uh, took place. Uh, after that, and also with the, the speech of our President Jean-Claude Juncker last week in Strasbourg, it will be high time to push forward an ambitious reform of the uh, Eurozone. There is a window of opportunity, but uh, we must be conscious, like all windows, uh, uh, it opens and it closes. And we don't have that much time uh, to be ambitious enough for a reform. So um, I'm not a Marxist anymore either. <laughs> Um, but so let's allow for this scenario in which political agency can have potentially at least a transformative impact on Europe's political economy. Let's grant, grant that. And it must be the hope anyway of democratic politicians that you can affect that kind of change. So what for you would be the key things we have to shift within the structure of the Eurozone that will turn it from being what in the eyes of many people remains a prison-like structure, admittedly a prison in which, as it were, the terms and conditions are getting a little bit better, the food has improved, people are getting to spend more time in the yard, but nevertheless it remains a constraining structure. How do we turn it into something that could be expansive um, and that would reinforce and, if you like, vindicate that confidence? that Europeans, despite the tortures of recent years, still continue to express for the euro. How do we, how do we actually make good on that promise? And that image is strong, and it's good too. You would think, intuitively, that people in Greece would like to go out of this prison, yeah. out of jail, and be fiercely anti-euro. The surprise is that they are among the most pro-euro in Greece, in Europe. 75% of, of the Greeks are attached to the euro. And if Mr. Tsipras, with whom I cooperate well, who is also a personal friend, but who is the Prime Minister of Greece, has made, I wouldn't call that a U-turn, but certainly a turn, it's because at one moment this was confronted to a contradiction. Do I s stick to my initial program, or do I follow the pro-euro feeling of my uh, citizens? And if made a second choice, and in my view, he was right. <coughs> Why so? Again, unity, protection, stability, and the fear that being out would be worse than being in, but that's not enough. If you want, and that's the case for national reform or for European reform, to uh, design a reform, you must first have a diagnosis. What do we lack? We have three deficits in the uh, euro. The first deficit is a deficit of efficiency. As I said, the economic situation is much better. But what the economists call our potential growth is still too weak. It's a bit over 1%. It's less than our nominal growth. And especially 
there is one thing that we don't get enough, that's investment. Uh, that's why we created the so-called Juncker plan in order to uh, foster investment um, in the union as a whole. The second thing we lack uh, or we miss is solidarity. I'm not talking about transfers. I know how bad is the world for, for some friends in the Eurozone, but still, there are too many divergences in the Eurozone. If you look at unemployment, Germany, uh, the unemployment rate is uh, <coughs> twice smaller than the average of the uh, Eurozone. If you look at public debt, public debt of Italy is twice uh, the uh, public debt of Germany. Uh, if you look at uh, external surpluses, you see on the one hand massive uh, surpluses and on the other hand massive deficits. We cannot live with that forever. Because if we do, you'll have the feeling that some uh, of the benefits of a uh, 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 Eurozone with rules, whilst some others feel that they are forever in austerity and without full employment. And it will create a backlash at one moment. So solidarity, reducing divergences is the second point. The third point is democracy. And that's massive to me. Uh, as I said, I belong to the institutions of the uh, uh, Eurozone for five years. I'm also the guy who, who deals with Greece for five years. I, I'm, I'm the negotiator of the Commission uh, with my team, uh, with Greece. We have decided things for Greece which were globally right, but in a process that was not acceptable. Behind closed doors, 20 people or so decide that, well, there will be this on pension, this on labor market, this on energy, this on that, etc. Who is going to uh, uh, the uh, Greek parliament? Who is going to the European parliament? Do, does anybody here in this room know precisely what are the criteria of those reforms, etc.? You cannot function that way in a democracy. That's why the basic triangle is a budget for more efficiency and more solidarity. Is a minister of finance to have a stronger governance uh, and uh, for democratic accountability. And a parliament, which basically should be the European Parliament, uh, to control uh, and to approve the budget and to control the minister and then uh, this accountability could also derive to citizens because they will know uh, with a reasonable amount of transparency what happens and there will be a feedback and political debate which is normal. We need other tools such as a European Monetary Fund or a Treasury to lead this uh, policy for example. We need to have what we call a safe asset not your bonds in order to uh, uh, manage new debt issuance for the future. Uh, that's very ambitious, but that's basically what will be discussed during the year to come. And, and when I spoke about the momentum, uh, I think it really exists because we've got on the one hand the proposals of Mr. Macron, on the other hand the speech of Mr. Juncker last week, and Madame Merkel herself, she might be elected as chancellor if I read the polls, uh, uh, says now that she could consider Mr. Finance, she could consider uh, a budget of limited amount, uh, she could even consider a Eurozone Parliament. Uh, my old friend uh, Wolfgang Schauble is proposing a European Monetary Fund. Not exactly the way I would see it, because more intergovernmental, but still, well, now it's on the agenda. And that's the moment. Uh, we must seize the moment. This is a perhaps an unfair question, but um, I'm prepared to everything. But. Um, you want a safe asset, but you can't talk about eurobonds. We need solidarity, but we can't talk about transfer union. There's a reason for both of those um, prohibitions. And the reason is the sensibilities of the German political system. It's very straightforward. Both of those things are taboo, and if they're either mentioned in that particular phraseology, the conversation stops. So. This, to me, seems to me the critical question about this project of democratization. Because it would be wrong to say that the Eurozone crisis did not hear the voice of democracy. It heard the voice of one democracy extremely loudly throughout the entire process, which was the largest and arguably the best run, and in many respects the most successful, 
and in many ways an absolutely exemplary political system, which is, however, also the largest and most powerful state, and one which, without claims to hegemony and imperialism, just self-confidently asserted itself as a veto player throughout the entire negotiations, knowing perfectly well that the longer everything took, the more acute the position became, so that time management and the tactics of time management are the essence, actually, of power in a situation like that. Now, all of the projects of reform that you're suggesting seem to me to run up against that basic question, which is, will Berlin play ball? Is there a coalition in Germany that will allow what, from the point of view of right-thinking people virtually everywhere, is the obvious agenda of next steps, which even Berlin at some moments will acknowledge are the agenda of next steps. What is the... And our understanding was they needed an upfront payment. They needed fiscal discipline. They needed to see lots of fiscal discipline, debt breaks all around. And once they had debt breaks all around, then we could go to the next steps. Like, that surely is the critical question in political terms within the Eurozone. Are we actually at the point at which the Germans feel satisfied that they can make these next steps, which whatever we call them, the safe asset which isn't the Euro bond, is going to be some sort of common European credit in which the Germans, one way or another, will share some kind of liability. Like, so that, for me, is this, uh, the, uh, yeah, the no, question. I understood, but uh, uh, you know, I've been in politics for quite a while, um, maybe too long. The future will tell that. Uh, I know um, a bit about negotiation, although I'm not a diplomat, uh, not at all. Uh, and I know that semantics matter. If you read our reflection paper on EMU, mm -hmm. delivered a few months ago, we are not talking about the budget. No. We are talking about a fiscal capacity. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about the Minister of Finance for the Eurozone. We are saying that maybe we could merge the functions of the uh, chair of the Eurogroup and uh, the commissioner for ECFIN at the same time. Uh, we are not talking about a European Treasury. We are talking about a European Monetary Fund. We are not talking about the European Parliament, we are talking about a parliamentary control that we can exert, etc. We are not talking about Eurobonds, we are talking about a safe asset. Semantics matter. Because if you need, if you want to build compromises, then you need to talk in a language that can be accepted by all. And my experience as a politician, I've been elected for the first time in the European Parliament 23 years ago. I was Minister of European Affairs 20 years ago. Well, that makes me much older. But is that without a consent between France and Germany, especially, between, but between Germany and all its partners, nothing happens in the union. That doesn't mean that if you've got France and Germany together, everything happens, but that's a sine qua non condition. So we must have Germany on board. It's absolutely necessary. And it's not only about semantics. It's also to say you must not t stick to words and have bad images about the words. Mm -hmm. The reality matters. And what we are proposing is sound, solid, mm -hmm. reasonable. Yeah. And my message to my German friends, I dedicated all my European life to Franco-German friendship. Uh, I believe that it's absolutely necessary that we cannot do without, is there is something wrong in thinking that your own model is good for the whole EU, and there is something wrong on thinking that status quo is the solution, that moving on with only rules of, or risk reduction will create an optimal situation. And if your partners, my German friends, behave bad, if they feel bad, if they, at one moment they back at, backlash against you, against rules, against discipline, it's not in your interest. Germany is at the core of Europe. Uh, when I was European Finance Minister 20 years ago, well, at that moment, we had not enlarged Europe. Uh, the capital of Germany was in Bonn, who was a small town nearby France. When you're in Berlin now, you are at the very center of Europe with nine countries having borders with Germany. The interest in Germany is that everybody's on board, that everybody feels well. And if for that you need a minimal solidarity, if you need not only risk reduction, but also risk sharing, that is not the interest of those lazy guys who do not do their own work, etc. We are not the club mad. No, it's in your own interest. And we must find the right balance between risk reduction and risk sharing 
between intergovernmentalism and a more federalist approach, between respect of the rules and expansion. As a commissioner for ECFIN, when I was nominated in that job, I was not necessarily considered as the best guy for the German conservative. I'm a French social democrat. Uh, and being French and social democrat sometimes doesn't look well for some in Berlin. Uh, I think I've made my, my job, and, and we have explained a lot, and we go well with Berlin. This commission is the commission of the respect of the rules. Uh, if I look at deficits in 2011 and now, they were over 6% average mm. in the Eurozone. They are at 1.3%. If that doesn't mean rules are functioning, what are the rules mm. for? I, if I look at the number of countries in excessive deficit procedure, uh, almost all e Eurozone countries were in excessive deficit procedure in 2011. I hope in 2018 there will be zero after France and Spain left, if that's not about the respect of the rules. But I always refuse to apply the rules stupidly. We introduced a notion that was not spontaneously uh, applauded uh, somewhere, which was flexibility. Uh, one year ago, one year ago, some people looking at the rules could say, OK, with Spain and Portugal, there are borderline cases as far as public finances are concerned. We will apply them a fine, a fine of 1% of GDP, 0.2% uh, of GDP. But, uh, we will suspend part of the structural funds for them. I, I said that absurd. What happened six months after? Portugal is in a boom and is out of excessive deficit procedure. Having a part of political touch is good. So you can combine rules and flexibility. So I will stop by that. Uh, I, I think that uh, in Berlin, in Germany, after the elections, well, the door must also be opened. And we'll care about semantics, and not only about semantics, about substance, and try to find a compromise in which everybody can uh, be uh, satisfied with. It's, it's, and one could say, certainly on the safe asset question, that it's not actually a matter of semantics, it's a matter of macroeconomics. But in other words, safe asset is not your bonds, because with your bonds you're dealing yeah. with past debt. And I understand that uh, people yeah. refuse that mutualization. Safe asset is about future debt. Yes. It's not the same. And the semantics is crucial because it allows you to explain, perhaps, to the Germans that one person's debt mm -hmm. is another person's asset. In other words, Absolutely. they need something to put their savings into, which there will not be any more bunts given the debt break and Schäuble, Schwarz and all. So this has been a fascinating opening. I'm sure there's going to be questions in the hall. Let me, let me start making a cue. Do I have a, a question from the, the audience? Do I see a hand? Yes, here. Maybe if you can introduce yourself. Do we have a mic that's uh, working? <coughs> Let the commissioner know. Yes, here, gentleman here, and then one at the back. Gentleman at the back in the white shirt. Two gentlemen at the back in white shirts. Do you want to take that one? Yeah. Straight off? Uh, first of all, uh, in, in uh, President Juncker's speech last week is a very important part. Uh, I want to insist on that. That is to say that in the future, euro should be the currency of the whole union. I know this shocked, but I'm surprised that it did. Because if I look at our treaty, I see that in our treaty, the euro is a currency of the union. Only one country. Denmark as an opt-out. All others have their place in the uh, Eurozone. And this is why we say we will help those who want to exceed to do so. That doesn't mean, and that's something on which I would like to be reassuring, that anybody can be forced to join the Euro. 
if a country doesn't want to get in. OK, but that means that the door is opened, that we are in an inclusive process, that if somebody wants to join, he can if he has the will to do that and fills the criteria. So that's also the reason why President Juncker, in his speech, for example, speaking about the minister, said it was the Minister of Economy and Finance of the Union. And speaking about the Parliament of the Eurozone, said, I don't like that. I would prefer that to be a European Parliament. Then the European Parliament can organize itself in order to deal with Eurozone matters. But that's important to know that it is inclusive and that finally Eurozone and EU Union are not two different things. But for the time being, and I imagine for quite a while, maybe for a long time, there will be the Eurozone and there will be the EU. The EU is the place where we define our common fate. Single market is not a privilege of the Eurozone, it's for all. Uh, uh, the budget is the budget of the Union. Uh, all our policies apply to the Union. Uh, we discussed about global matters and international matters in the Union. The driving uh, body is the European Council, not the Eurozone Summit. We didn't have a Eurozone Summit since 2015. But for those who are in the Eurozone, we need to have a better governance. Uh, you, you cannot have such uh, a driving engine as the euro without democratic governance. Frankly speaking, I said that, and that created to me some arguments in Ambrosetti, in uh, Villa d'Este, uh, three weeks ago. I spoke about the democratic scandal, and good friends of mine with important jobs tell me, well, scandal? Well, you're not so gentle. I said, no, the scandal is not the decision we take together. Uh, the, the scandal is not the leadership of the Eurogroup. The scandal is the democratic process. Uh, I've never seen something like that in my whole life. I've always been controlled by people, by a parliament. Uh, as a commissioner, we are vetted by the parliament. Uh, we have hearings uh, for ourselves. So, well, uh, that's the way to combine both. Guy at the back. That's right, please stick your hand up. Dark hair first, and then well, either way, it's not dark hair. No. We'll maybe take two questions back to back and then you can start. Yeah. And Shin, Ali, my, my question follows from the, from the preceding one on, on democracy. Uh, I'm wondering whether there's not a tension a bit more profound than the one you've described between EU 27 and the Euro Area 19 uh, in, in the following sense. Um, if there is a stronger need for building up democratic control for the Euro Area for the reasons that, that you've expressed, and if the Commission insists on continuing to um, limit the institutional flexibility to focus on the EU27, to constrain the ability of the Commission to serve the 19, don't you see a risk that the Euro Area 19 will continue to progress in its deepening through intergovernmental arrangements? So isn't there a tension there that by virtue of refusing or trying to be too ex inclusive, you take the chance of, of letting uh, On surpluses, first, we have, I have, because that's my task as a commissioner, uh, two uh, important tools in our hands. The first one is the so-called excessive deficit procedure. It's a very constraining and binding procedure, very powerful. And that procedure led with the possibility of sanctions. I was always against sanctions, but always pro-dissuasion, uh, to dialogue with member states so that they reduce the deficits and also establish structural reforms. 
this procedure has worked so well that now we won't have a member state in excessive deficit procedure in 2018. That doesn't mean that their effort is over because when you're under 3%, which is the case of most of them, you must not only reduce your nominal deficit, but also your structural deficits, which are the ones uh, who work even if uh, with independently of growth. Uh, the second procedure exists. It's called the macro imbalances procedure. Honesty leads me to say that it's much less effective, that we only there analyze, recommend, uh, benchmark, but that we have no possibility. Uh, for years, we are telling two countries, especially Germany and Netherlands, that their imbalances are excessive because they have huge surpluses and they should invest more to reduce them. The traditional answer of the uh, finance minister of uh, Germany, and it's honest, and it's true, that we started to do that. We've been investing 15 billion euros more. But still, the imbalances grow and grow. And when I say it's too high, tell me, well, how can we stop people to buy excellent German products or Dutch products? And that's true. But still, there is a need to have a reduction. We don't have a tool which is powerful enough. But I think the most powerful tool is to be conscious of that and to act decisively. And that's what member states should do. Can I just interject? Isn't there basically a contradiction between the success of the fiscal policy discipline and this other objective that you had? And the answer to Germany's imbalance is they need to run a substantial government deficit, which should consist of state-driven investment in bits of Germany's creaking infrastructure. And if that deficit was about 4% of GDP, 5% of GDP, then we could look at whether their current account was as still as enormous as it currently is. But their current situation of having 8 9% on current account and then a surplus on the government deficit is, is basically, you know, it's an it's a, it's a incoherent uh, set of assignments. No, I don't want to intervene in too much into German politics. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, should there be a schwarz null? Should there be a surplus? Should it be a, a deficit? Did the rule of the treaty lead to 0.5%? Well, I'm not going to intervene too much on that. I trust that Germany at one moment uh, knows uh, what it has to be, whatever it takes. Uh, but, well, uh, I have to be careful on that. I'm sorry for that. But I think that things could be done and, and could be done without a substantial deficit. The question is not to get back to 1%, 2%, 3%. What we say, and we respect member states, is that each member state, especially those, have a room of maneuver. Mm. It's up to them to define that rule and to use it. Then on the second question, I understand what you say. And that probably you mean the risk of uh, the Juncker speech last week in the European Parliament. You must understand that the Commission is in its role. The Commission is there to defend the treaties. And obviously the treaties say that the euro is the currency of the Union. Second, we are also there to ensure that there is unity inside our union. We've made too many moves historically to unite the Europe, to accept that now there are new divides, definitely between East and West, between North and South, between ins and outs. If we move that way, I know that economically that is suboptimal, then politically, we will have the return of nationalism. We already have. And that is something terrible. But I think there is a maybe more subtle reading of the Juncker speech. When President Juncker says that this is the future of the Union, he starts from the Eurozone. We don't have to wait for the Euro to be the currency of all to create a, a Minister of Finance for the Eurozone. I would say we could do that tomorrow, even without treaty change. If at one moment, ministers in the EU group say, OK, we think it's high time to have the merger between uh, the president of the EU group and the commissioner in charge of economic and finance, my job today. That could be done 
informally because it's an informal group. About the European Parliament being the Parliament of the Eurozone, I understand fully what Jean-Claude says. He says, it's no use to create a separate Parliament. How right he is. We have already too many institutions, and that is unclear. Uh, and for those, for example, like Thomas Piketty and others who say we should create a parliament coming from national uh, uh, parliaments. Silly. Uh, I've been a member of the national parliament too, sorry, in too many uh, political functions for 15 years. What is a national MP about, a congressman? First, is if he's very good, he cares about internal legislation. If he's less good, he thinks about his constituency. If he's excellent, he's, he thinks about Europe, but that's really in the back of his mind. You cannot create a parliament of the Eurozone like that. But inside the European Parliament, mm. countries from the Eurozone could organize themselves. Nothing forbids them to create a, a, a separate committee. For example, the Eurogroup, what is the Eurogroup? The Eurogroup is an informal group inside the Council. I remember I was there in June 1997 under the Luxembourg presidency. There was a debate between Tony Blair and Lionel Jospin, and the challenge was apparently minimal. Tony said, we should start on Monday with the ECOFIN, and then on Tuesday we'll have the EU group. And Jospin, also Strauss-Kahn and myself, we said, no, let's start with the EU group, and then uh, the ECOFIN. <laughs> Seems minor. It was not. Uh, the one who starts as the main focus. On Mondays, we've got the EU group, and, and then on Tuesdays, we've got the ECOFIN. That's a total change. But the European Parliament, as any parliament, is free to organize itself as it is. So I think we can easily avoid that mismatch. That is to say that what is proposed could first fit for the Eurozone as it is, without creating totally new institutions, and then extend to the EU, becoming, in that scenario, uh, the, the, uh, the common uh, place uh, for the Eurozone. We can articulate both. Two questions. Really? Uh, and I think that Jean-Claude had also in, in mind the idea is to, to create the framework for a compromise. Uh, the Commission is there to do that, to be the honest broker. Uh, it's logical that the French, I'm French, speak a lot about solidarity, uh, expansion, etc. It's quite logical that the Germans speak about stability, respect of the rules, risk reduction. It's quite logical that the Commission speaks about unity. Uh, and then we'll see what happens in the end, and we'll have to take a bit of uh, all those regards and others. So you are Marxist after all. <laughs> uh, question in the right. Once a Marxist, always a Marxist. <laughs> we'll see. Question in the right. um, Hi, Richie. I'm from a graduate from the uh, journalism school here in Colombia. And, uh, you know, just to follow up in what you mentioned about the populism in Europe and that was so close in Austria, in France, but then the voters rejected, uh, you know, those candidates. And here we have the uh, recent event, you know, Charlottesville, and I'm sure you heard of that. You know, it's still fear sometimes the position of our leaders. So um, it's just like an opinion of very experienced and you know, because of uh, you know, Europe, how can uh, which lessons can America kind of learn from what you guys go through there in so many different countries and cultures and this moments? C can I tack on one more uh, lady in salmon here at the with the polo shirt? Thank you. been recognized as a, a return to the discipline of the gold standard without the possibility of devaluation. I wonder what, how your recommended changes would have led to a difference in the way the Greek, Greek crisis was treated. Thank you. You take those two and then we'll gather a few more. On, on Charlottesville I will be uh, cautious because uh, I'm here the host of this country. Uh, and that uh, in my capacity of EU Commissioner, I deal with the government of this country. Yesterday I, I met uh, Steven Mnuchin, uh, I was two days ago in Washington, 
to meet uh, officials at the White House and elsewhere, Congress too. Um, and my true belief is that uh, Europe and America and the United States of America must go along together. And uh, uh, it's too easy to oppose one to each other, even if sometimes uh, I feel that President Trump, that's not his idea, is the best electoral agent for uh, the European idea. Uh, and that uh, some is uh, positions that can be provocative help us to feel that we need more united. But well, that's the only thing I can say about that. On Charlottesville, I'm not commenting on, uh, on this or that position. Some senior advisors in the White House did what they had to say. But it's true that we have had our experiences. Uh, I myself, uh, my father, was Jew, and he was in work, working camp for five years during the war. My mother was Jew, and uh, she was in France. She was uh, in a small village, uh, hired by, hired by Jew, by, by just of the nations. We know what the experience of Nazism is, and that's why we're here as Europeans. And my father and mother always told me, it's precisely because we have that fight with Germany that we need unite, to be united with them. The only way to be reconciled is to unite, and to be united around some values. What are these values? They are in our Declaration of Rights. Uh, they say that, for example, we are against any kind of racism. We are against any kind of discrimination. Uh, we are in favor of equality between men and women. We don't have death penalty in Europe now. We're very proud of it. We could not accept uh, a candidate which would recreate death penalty. That's also a message to Turkey, eventually. Uh, women can abort. We are anti-climate change, and we are deeply committed uh, to, to that. We are all in the framework of the Paris Agreements. We stick to our values. It happens that my father was a, a professor, and uh, I first came in this country long time ago when he was teaching in Princeton. And I cannot remember a year in my whole life where I didn't come here in the US. I love this country. And there is something I cannot understand in what happens, and which is a huge worry for me. Uh, because I love the United States, I'm attached to a certain conception of democracy uh, and of values. And the idea that one can be indulgent with white supremacists or with neo-Nazi movements. And even that that one ex can exist in this country is something that shocks me deeply. I cannot say more. And I think that you should learn from it. Thank you. The Eurozone, gold standard, uh, and Greece. <laughs> I'm not talking about the gold, gold standard, but I'm talking about Greece. What could have it changed? Not everything, because I, I'm not one of those who believe that austerity has created the crisis in Greece. What has created the crisis in Greece is that this country was not ready to come in the Eurozone. That its public accounts, its public finances were fake. That its economic system was artificial. That the uh, social system was unsustainable. You cannot live with a country with uh, huge amounts of debts, uh, with uh, uh, failed accounts, uh, with companies who don't know who's working for them, uh, with pensions representing 6% GDP more than uh, in the uh, other Eurozone countries. That was not possible. So I'm the last to say that Greece needed no reform. I'm anti Varoufakis on that. I think that Varoufakis was a tremendous loss of waste of time, energy for his country without accepting to negotiate. The role of a finance minister is to negotiate. I think we need more Tsipras and less Varoufakis, and also as the Social Democrats as well. That's another point. But uh, I also believe that those efforts that were necessary might have been better proportionate, and that mistakes were done, that we certainly sometimes overplayed. 
And one of the reasons why we did was the special governance of the Euro. Because when there is no democracy, there is no control. When there is no control, sometimes you're off balance. And I think that if there would have been a finance minister for the Eurozone, a parliament of the Eurozone, and a budget for the Eurozone, with a budget we could have been doing more for growth and jobs in Greece. With the minister, the guidance might have been stronger. And with the control of the parliament, some insufficiencies on the one hand and excesses in the other hand could have been controlled. Not more than that. It wouldn't have changed the course of the existence since uh, Greece wanted to be in the Eurozone and we wanted Greece to be in the Eurozone. I was always anti-Grexit, like the President of the Commission. I always thought that we should avoid that, not at any price. Uh, the price was reforms. But well, when you've got a democratic system and economic tools, uh, you can have a much more balanced approach than we did. We made probably mistakes because we invented those tools in the midst of the crisis. And so with new tools, we muddled through I'm not criticizing anybody. Uh, I'm in the room uh, for five years, and I'm not schizophrenic enough to criticize decisions that I contributed to take myself. But well, with a democratic system, I think things are much better. That's why, in my reflection about the future of the Eurozone, democracy is at the core of it, really. I'm here to bring another question in. Yes, go ahead. Well, that's a, a very uh, up-to-date uh, uh, question because we precisely are delivering uh, today uh, communication uh, on digital taxation. Uh, first of all, it's time that digital companies pay their fair share of taxes where they create values and profits exactly as other economy. The problem is that our tax system was designed one century ago for the economy of the 20th century and not for the economy of the 21st century, which is much more dematerialized, delocalized, um, and, and hard to catch. Some very important companies, I'm not going to name uh, one of them, uh, have no uh, stable establishment here or there. They don't have even boutiques. You don't know who's working for there. You don't know. You, we need to, to know what digital presence means. And that's what we are working on at the OECD and G20 level, uh, and we need to be in that framework. Then I think we need to have a, also a common tool, and in my view that's a, a common consolidated corporate tax base uh, in order to avoid profit shifting, to be capable of taxing those companies as others uh, with a threshold on their uh, profits, and we, we affirm that. That's for the logics of it. Then the question is when and how for the time being, I'm also the tax commissioner. We have a quite important problem is that all the decisions need to be taken unanimously. That means the veto of one can stop the will of all the others. And in tax matters, there is a huge solidar so sovereignty. I cannot stop uh, the uh, Irish government and any Irish government to have a 12.5% uh, corporate tax rate even if having a 0.05% tax rate, effectively, as some very important company uh, had uh, in the past, uh, was not acceptable. So uh, we had to consider that as a state aid. I think it would be much better uh, if we could have qu qualified majority voting uh, on a lot of items. That's what uh, uh, issues, that's what President Juncker proposed last week. I'm having no illusions on that, but the treaty authorizes the council to decide that. The debate is also on the table, and that's probably the sense of our future. 
So I imagine that we won't have a common tax rate, but I hope that our member states will be wise enough to consider that it is of their general interest to have a common tax base and a consolidated one so that the rules are the same for all, which forbids loopholes, which avoids to create tax uh, digital heavens, uh, and which uh, also uh, avoids profit shifting, which is one of the major problems we have to face. There is a proposal already on the table. I really hope that it can be adopted quite swiftly. And there again, you know, the, the work of EU commissioner is sometimes titanic. It's to create compromise between uh, 28 member states. We'll dedicate all our energy to that. A compromise means that your proposal is not exactly the same after the discussion than before. But you need to feel, to have the sense of where compromise is possible. We cannot have a bad compromise, but we will try to have a compromise which represents a progress as big as possible in that field. And the debate now is also in, in the agenda. One more question, the general going with the beard. You go up for the business board. Um, I have a question if you talk about French politics. What are your thoughts on uh, the current reforms being made by uh, Mr. Macron? And if you had to go back to France, which party would you join? <laughs> <laughs> well, for the reforms, I'm, I'm going to see what happens because they just started to be launched. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and uh, the European Commission is not there uh, to judge uh, this or that reform. I will take an example. Uh, Mr. Macron is reforming the labor market. I don't have to say if this or that measure in his reform is good. That's comfortable for me. Uh, but what I know from experience is those countries inside the EU which have reformed the labor markets feel much better for job creation than those who don't. Because you cannot have an insider's labor market. You need to lift barriers for those who want to join. But this reform can only be judged if you have other reforms, especially on, on training, professional, vocational training. Uh, if the idea is to have pure flexibility, as a social democrat, I'm not so fond of it. If the idea is to have what we call in, it was, was launched by Denmark or Sweden in the social democratic era, flexi security, that's a bit different. And as not a commissioner, but a citizen, I'm going to judge the whole package, not only one bit of it. And for the time being, I don't see, I don't know, you don't know either, what precisely the package, will be. you know what the program is. You don't know what, the devil is always in the details. And so we are going to look at that carefully. And I hope uh, that this country needs to be reformed. I hope that Mr. Macron will have strong reforms. And a good reform for me is a reform which is deep and fair. And I'm attached to both. I think that's the very definition of social democracy. That is to, to transform, to change the economy, and also to change the society uh, in a fair way. Which party? I can only adhere to a social democratic party. So I belong to the Socialist Party for quite a while. I hope he will choose definitely the social democrat way. And if I would have to consider another party, I couldn't adhere to a conservative party. So, but maybe other parties can also join the social democratic way. That's the charm of the present situation in France, is that you don't precisely know that it's up to the actors to define their own role and strategy, and so on and so forth. For example, to be more precise, Mr. Macron has been elected by a party who is neither right, neither left, or pretends to be at the same time right and left. I'm not enthusiastic about that because I'm from center left. But I don't know what the future of this party is. Uh, will it move like the Democratic Party in Italy? Or will it get to a center right party? It's not up to me to decide. I'm told to change my own mind. 
and my own ideas. And so, uh, well, I'll see uh, what happens in two years from now, because for the two years to come, I don't have to come back to France. <laughs> and, and I think that in, in two years from now, things will be a bit clearer. So it will be easier for me. If I envisage to go back to politics, which is not that certain, because uh, I dedicated so much of my life to Europe, and I think that this must stay uh, the baseline of my activities uh, for the future. And that's that ministry we have to fill <laughs> has to be created. Thank you so much for this conversation.